This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. recommended the establishment of an aeronautic center at Pensacola for flight and ground training for the study of advanced aeronautical engineering. As Captain Plummer said, Lieutenant Commander Henry Muston, who was aviator number 11, was in command of this new naval air station. Many years later, Muston's grandson, Vice Admiral Henry C. Muston, suggested that the handful of guys running around talking about flying machines were considered oddballs by Washington. And the best way to get them out of the brass's hair was to get them out of town. Hence the move from Annapolis to the Florida Panhandle and the cradle of naval aviation. So begins the story of naval aviation 2011 marks 100 years of the Navy flight saga. There are commemorations and special events going on all year, not just like this one here, but across the whole country. The grand finale will be held in Washington's Air and Space Museum in December. Hello, welcome to Connecting the Community, CTC. I'm Lloyd Patterson. Let's talk flying. Our guests on this program today, retired Marine Colonel Dennis Deej Kiley. He flew an F-8 Crusader jet on more than 200 missions during Vietnam. Today, he volunteers at the Naval Aviation Museum and is the senior editor of the magazine, uh, the Museum Foundation's magazine. Retired Admiral Gerald Hoeing is president and CEO of the Naval Aviation Museum Foundation, and he's also president of the soon-to-open National Flight Academy, served in many high-level roles in his Navy years. And Hill Goodspeed is a naval historian and author of five books. He is the artifacts manager at the Aviation Museum. Welcome to all of you. Uh, what a time it is to be involved in your field at being at the Naval Aviation Museum and to be able to look back on all these years and the steps that led us here today. We just heard a quote from an early uh, admiral who said that they thought that the guys who were going to fly were oddballs. Let's get them out of Washington and send them to Pensacola. That sounds pretty, that sounds kind of funny today, doesn't it, Admiral Hoeing? Well, there's a lot of people that think it's always good to get out of Washington, D.C., and what a great place to come like Pensacola. But, uh, you know, as you got started in naval aviation, you know, it was a challenge out there. Nobody knew what the future was going to bring. This was uh, all developmental sort of stuff. And uh, I just think they made a great choice when they chose Pensacola in order to get naval aviation off the ground. And Colonel Kiley, this admiral who we, we quoted off the top, he probably, that was probably a well well-known school of thought that these guys are, uh, they're a little bit kooky. Let's get the fly guys out of here. We like ships. We're the Navy. Well, that statement was made by an Admiral Benson, and it was sometime after we really got started into aviation. But the, it's really important to note that uh, visionaries like Theodore Roosevelt, who was Assistant Secretary of the Navy, uh, at the turn of the century, uh, foresaw the use of aviation uh, in the fleet, mainly because of the introduction of uh, ships, uh, the class of uh, battleships, the dreadnoughts, HMS Dreadnought as the leader of the class in the Royal Navy, and they brought to, to bear uh, much heavier caliber guns, and it made spotting shot very difficult because those guns could fire beyond the horizon line. So there, there was a need for some way of spotting that shot, and that gave impetus to the interest in aviation despite the skepticism. Hill Goodspeed. The uh, early days were pretty rocky, weren't they? 
Uh, they were. Um, the naval aviation struggled to find really a home. It, its operations really shifted with the weather. And if it was in cold weather months, they'd go to California or Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. And in warmer weather, they actually flew from Annapolis, Maryland, right across from the Naval Academy. But really, um, the core of pioneer aviators that were assembled, um, they, they gained confidence and they gained skills as they learned to fly initially from the early aircraft manufacturers and then teaching one another and the new students that came in. And uh, coming to Pensacola was, you know, although it may have been viewed as a good uh, measure to get them out of Washington, it was actually a very favorable thing for naval aviation because naval aviation at the time operated primarily seaplanes. Um, the early aviators didn't even really look at wheeled aircraft or flying from land as an option because it was, after all, naval aviation. So Pensacola Bay was just an ideal spot for that. It was really a, a, a a natural runway for those seaplanes, and there was some infrastructure here, and, and with the nice weather that, uh, that Pensacola enjoys year-round, it was really a beneficial move for naval aviation. I note that the, the uh, history, the centennial, the 100-year uh, anniversary of naval aviation is actually headquartered in San Diego. There's a lot of Navy in San Diego. Wouldn't it have made just as much sense to put the Navy's aviation operation in California? They were there. Uh, Glenn Curtis moved them out. Those were his winter quarters when they moved to what is today North Island uh, in San Diego. And that's where the first naval aviator was actually trained. Hill? Yes, uh, Glenn Curtis, who was uh, really the primary supplier of naval aircraft early on, he specialized in seaplanes. And um, that was actually where the Navy's first aircraft, the A-1 Triad, uh, did a lot of the early uh, experimentation there and at uh, Curtis's headquarters up in, or his uh, hometown really, and the home base for his manufacturing was up in Hammondsport, New York. So it really could have been out at, uh, at North Island in California, but I think what made Pensacola more beneficial when they made the decision was that Pensacola had been a Navy yard for a, uh, a long time, since the 19th century. And uh, North Island was really just a spit of barren land in the middle of San Diego Bay. So I think the fact that there was infrastructure here certainly uh, made the decision to send them here to Pensacola a viable one. In fact, many of our friends in San Diego call themselves, we call ourselves the, uh, the cradle of naval aviation. They call themselves the birthplace of naval aviation because of those early flights that Hill's been talking about. So, yeah, we share, I think, with our friends in San Diego, and, uh, and the centennial started there this year. Uh, the actual birth date, the 100th anniversary, you know, that fell on this last weekend here in, uh, in Pensacola on the, on the 8th of May. And, of course, we'll end up in Washington, D.C. So uh, there's lots of celebrating to be done. But there was naval aviation, and then there was the actual move to Pensacola, which came, which were not simultaneous. Yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, while we call it the cradle of naval aviation here, it's because this was the first naval air station or aeronautic station uh, so designated. However, uh, we had been at Greenbury Point, which is on the opposite bank of the Severn River by the U.S. Naval Academy, and that was technically termed a naval air encampment. So that's why Pensacola was the first naval air station. And the Marine came at. We also want to make clear that the naval aviation, we're not just talking about the Navy, are we? No. The naval aviation encompasses the Navy, the Marine Corps, and the Coast Guard. Um, and, of course, all those sailors uh, in all those services that support naval aviation. So naval aviation isn't just blue. You know, we, uh, we cover the entire spectrum of the maritime services. One of the things I think was interesting in reading about the history of uh, the, uh, the work that was done on naval aviation is that was recognized early on that you not only needed guys who could fly these things, you had to have a core of experts who could work on them and keep them, keep these things going. And it was recognized early on that this had to be, emphasis had to be placed on the ground crew. There was, uh, and there were a number of uh, names that come to mind immediately, Holden Richardson, Hunsecker, and as a matter of fact, uh, Admiral David Taylor, for whom the Taylor Model Basin in uh, D.C. is named. And he was uh, instrumental in the design of along with Holden Richardson, particularly in the design of seaplane hulls. And another yep. big uh, experiment going on, or really the technology they were trying to advance, was the catapult. And a lot of the early catapult experiments 
uh, occurred here in Pensacola. There was actually a barge uh, right near Allegheny Pier where they did some of the early catapult shots. And then a ship that was located here in Pensacola Bay was uh, USS North Carolina, which actually mm -hmm. uh, brought uh, the first aviators down here in January 1914. And the catapult experiments were very important because that was the uh, an essential component to getting aircraft aboard ship and able to go to sea with the fleet. It was recognized early on that, that just having a ship with a landing and takeoff uh, runway was not enough. A catapult was the was the next step, and that that changed. That was a game changer, wasn't it? Whoever invented that, that was seen right away. We got to have some way to sling these planes off the ship. That was a step by step process. It was a, it was almost a, uh, there was a parallel development. Uh, uh, that uh, first we attempted to mate the ship and the aircraft, and we did it by the use of seaplanes, which required uh, providing storage space aboard ship. And there was legislation at the time that future, uh, particularly cruisers and capital ships, uh, would uh, be designed with space for storing aircraft. Uh, and that the aircraft cranes uh, came into uh, use aboard ship. And the catapult was uh, a simple way of getting uh, off the ship uh, without having a, a, a flight deck, so to speak. And of course, we were using uh, the Navy was strictly, uh, in many ways, limited to uh, operating from the sea or with seaplanes, land planes with the purview of the Army. Uh, and uh, so the, the catapult was natural, uh, a natural uh, uh, outcome of trying to launch a seaplane from a ship. Admiral? And, and remember that uh, at, at this particular time, at, at the beginning of naval aviation, the airplane was used to extend the range of the surface ship. So that's why having that close connection, whether it be a seaplane or whether it be catapulted off, you know, what they were still trying to do was be able to see over the horizon and support the maritime mission. So it made sense, you know, whether it was a seaplane or a, or a catapult launched airplane because of that very close connection to the surface mission. When did it occur to somebody that say, hey, we could put, if we put a gun on this thing, this might be an effective weapon? Well, I think, uh, you know, they experimented early on with ordnance. And, um, but I think it was really in World War I where you start to see, just seeing the possibilities of what aircraft could do, both in air-to-ground attacks and also air-to-air -air combat, because that was really the, one of the early crucibles for military aviation was over the Western Front and in areas of World War I. And um, although the United States Navy got into World War I late, we didn't declare war until April 1917, the fact that uh, naval aviators and, per and other officers went overseas and witnessed and in some cases participated in that air-to-air -air combat and they saw the possibilities of, of military aviation, they brought back with them from World War I uh, just a, a tremendous amount of ideas as to how they could advance naval aviation in the U.S. Navy like they had witnessed overseas. Weren't they the actually British. using handguns uh, in some of those early like yeah. some of those early planes, yeah. the, the guy was shooting out with a uh, Colt 45. At Actually, uh, if you want to talk about embryonic uh, <laughs> air combat, uh, you can go back to Vera Cruz, uh, during which time we suffered our first uh, combat damage on an aircraft. We realized the importance of reconnaissance uh, during that operation, and it formed the basis for uh, reconnaissance, many reconnaissance procedures later uh, employed. And also, uh, uh, our pioneer aviator, number five aviator, uh, Pat Bellinger, uh, was the first guy to take offensive action, uh, having nothing more than a bar of soap to throw at the Mexicans, but that's the first real air combat. <laughs> uh, so guns came later. So he, he was looking for something to throw at the enemy, and a bar of soap was all he could lay his hands on. That's right. That's correct. We got no bomb damage assessment. Yeah, we don't know whether it was effective or not. <laughs> That's they, exactly right. They probably just were curious of what the, why we, we would be uh, dropping a bar of soap on. <laughs> what, what stands out in your, as you look at the, the seminal points along the road of 100 years of naval aviation, you just do, we, we assume flight, okay? Then what are, the, what are the big steps as you go down the road? The catapults? Well, I think it's certainly just, if you see how naval power has progressed, it certainly has to be the advent of the aircraft carrier, because that was really the true uh, marriage, so to speak, of 
the airplane and sea power and being able to project aviation in an offensive fashion. And so the first aircraft carrier was commissioned in 1922, uh, USS Langley, and she was actually converted from a collier, so she used to carry coal around supporting the fleet and then became uh, the first aircraft carrier. And they just stuck a deck on top of her? Uh, they uh, did a lot of modifications to try to create a hangar deck below to, for, to execute repairs of aircraft and then put a, put a flight deck. Uh, one observer said with all the steel girders she looked like the Brooklyn Bridge when looking at her from the side. But her nickname was a covered wagon because, she, because of appearance and the pioneering role she was going to play. And Langley uh, was the first step towards uh, what's the next, the next carrier to be commissioned was US, is going to be USS Gerald Ford. And so they all all the um, development of aircraft carrier aviation stems from Langley back in 1922. And we're watching a video of the Blue Angels from a, a recent show. Of course, the Blue Angels in Pensacola, they're identified as practically uh, one in the same. And these are the kind of jets that when they land uh, and take off from an aircraft carrier, the catapults that are on those today are amazingly powerful, aren't they? Uh, yeah, the uh, the catapults of today, as compared to the catapults uh, you know, of uh, years before, are, are extremely different. In fact, uh, most of us that are uh, of my vintage in naval aviation flew using steam catapults, where uh, whether it be a nuclear-powered carrier or a conventionally-powered carrier, it was the steam that wa that launched the aircraft by shoving a piston down the catapult. Now we're moving into an entire new domain of catapults uh, using electromagnetic influence in order to launch airplanes. It's, it's just a, an incredible transition from that first mechanical all the way through steam and now into emails. They but they can, take a, they can take an F-18, for instance, and get it going from zero to, to what? In about 150, 160 miles per hour in about two and a half seconds. Wow, that must be a heck of a ride. Probably to put a point on it, uh, the carrier, the aircraft carriers, the nexus, it, it, that's what makes naval aviation the most unique arm in America's defense. Um, we've come a long way. It, it was originally a British idea, and thanks to people like uh, Ken Whiting, uh, who was one of our first 15 uh, naval aviators who went to England. The British actually had six carriers in commission at the end of the first war. Uh, a uh, naval uh, architect named S. V. Goodall came to the United States in 1917 and showed us uh, how a carrier should be built. Uh, Whiting's idea, he saw a railroad ferry, and that became kind of the blueprint for building an aircraft carrier. Uh, it didn't turn out that way because the, the idea was not that uh, functional. But the, the aircraft carrier spawned uh, oh, oh, many things came from it, including the design of aircraft. A naval aircraft, a carrier aircraft, had to be small. It had to be highly reliable. It had to be multi-mission capable, and it had to have range or endurance. You only had that one landing field. Uh, so it spurred the development of the radial engine because the air-cooled engine was efficient and it involved uh, less. It was less prone to to uh, problems that accrued to the inline engine, which had a cooling system. They, we developed wheel brakes uh, on aircraft uh, because you couldn't move around a deck without being able to stop the aircraft. Uh, we developed the communications and navigation equipment. We were forerunners in that. And, and uh, there were many other things, including, uh, uh, um, last of all, uh, specific types of aircraft, particularly in, the, in Navy parlance, the dive bomber, or today's attack aircraft, which is the, that is the equivalent of a battleship salvo, except that it has a far greater range than a battleship's guns, but that's the main armament of an aircraft carrier, is the attack aircraft. If you just joined us, you're watching Connecting the Community, and today we're talking about 100 years of naval aviation, uh, actually about 97 years since the Navy moved the whole operation to Pensacola, and look at where it's gone in that time. Uh, we have with us today uh, Admiral Hoeing, the uh, uh, man in charge of the Naval Aviation Foundation, and also Hill Goodspeed, the uh, historian at the museum, and Colonel Kiley, who was a, a pilot, an F-8, uh, uh, Crusader F-8 
Crusader pilot. And the F-4. And the F-4 uh, during Vietnam, flew many missions. I read something that was really surprised me. I, you know, you think about aviation, naval aviation, marine aviation, Coast Guard aviation. You think about planes with wings. But I saw that something more than 40% of the pilots in the Navy are helicopter pilots, and it's more than 60% of the pilots in the Marines are helicopter pilots. Is that, does that sound about right? Do, do you, Sound, sounds about right. I'm not yeah, sure what is, the numbers it, are. It's substantially <laughs> correct, but then again, you consider that uh, helicopters require two pilots. They don't require it, but they're, they're set up for two pilots. So you've got, for every aircraft, you've got to double the manning level that you would have in a, something like an F-18 squadron. How much did the development of the helicopter change naval aviation? Well, it, it continues to change naval aviation even even today. Uh, the uh, the opportunity to hover, to rescue without having to uh, land, uh, was where they initially got their start. But today, and o actually over the last several years, but in particular today, the helicopter brings so much capability to the carrier strike group. Not just the aircraft carrier, but the surface ships that support them in many ways. Everything from anti-submarine warfare to attack helicopter operations, to logistic support, as well as search and rescue. And you talk a lot about naval aviation being not just Navy, but also Marine Corps and Coast Guard. Really, the helicopter, the genesis of it, was with the Coast Guard during World War II. Uh, it was uh, the, the Navy and Marine Corps were, were busy focusing on, on the two-front war, and it was the Coast Guard that really seized the initiative and developed rotary wing aviation and uh, using it for search and rescue and actually the first mission of mercy flown by a, by a naval helicopter was piloted by a Coast Guardsman, Frank Erickson, in January of 1944, delivering blood plasma to survivors of an explosion. So it was the Coast Guard that was really pushing the development? Very much so. During World War II, it was the Coast Guard that, that, uh, that was the driving force behind rotary wing aviation as far as naval aviation is concerned, yes. And of course, you have some beautiful well, uh, helicopters on. I'm going to put in a pitch for my Marine Corps because uh, the development of the helicopter as a tactical weapon and for tactical employment uh, was certainly the brainchild of Marines, particularly during the Korean War when we developed uh, the uh, program for what we called vertical envelopment, which was used all through Vietnam, is still being used. Plus that, uh, we took a look at the advantages that accrue to rotary wing aircraft, that is that they can land, in, uh, land vertically, take off vertically, land in tight zones, this kind of a thing. But it, it didn't meet the bill, so the Marine Corps looked ahead back in the 1960s and looked into two other programs, per particularly what we call Stovall, short takeoff vertical landing. And as a result, we brought the Harrier into being and made it a, a, a very successful weapon system. And, uh, and of late, uh, we have the MV-22, which is something of a hybrid. It is both helicopter and fixed wing airplane. It brings uh, twice the load at twice the speed now for uh, insertion. Uh, and uh, I'm glad to say that it has just passed its 100,000th flight hour on deployment in, in, uh, in Afghanistan. Okay. Admiral Hoeing, would you like to correct anything that the Colonel said about uh, uh, marine aviation versus uh, Na Navy? Not at all. You know, we're all on the same team. You know, that's why we call it naval aviation. And one of the things that many people may not necessarily realize is that just uh, recent operations in Libya, it was uh, MV-22 on a uh, mission, uh, you know, that went in and, and recovered uh, one of the two pilots uh, that ejected out of the F-15 that was lost on one of the early, early missions there. So these aircraft are extremely versatile. And what gives them, uh, I believe, uh, um, you know, a, a, a good start in this, uh, this environment here in the 21st century is the speed with, w with which they can go. It makes them more survivable it's, also. It's practically impossible to imagine a, a Navy Marine operation probably without helicopters these days. We, can, uh, to add to that, um, I think in, uh, during uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom, uh, we saw uh, the ideal employment of two systems. One, the strike aircraft carrier and the helicopter platform, uh, LPD, 
LSD, that kind of thing, where we took Harrier aircraft and moved them. They shuttled back and forth between land bases and the uh, helicopter carrier, uh, and they provided all the on-call close air support for troops on the ground, which relieved our our fleet assets, the uh, Navy, to, to perform strike missions because uh, the cyclic uh, um, structure of aircraft operations doesn't lend itself well to immediate on-call uh, close air support. So they divided the, it was a division of effort and it worked out uh, uh, excellently and it's a blueprint for the future for our Navy Marine team. Uh, we're down to our last few minutes here. I want to ask you about what you see as the future of Naval Aviation. Hill Goodspeed, is it going to, you look at this trajectory uh, uh, for the next decades ahead, is it going to be more unmanned uh, helicopters, uh, fixed wing? Well, I, I think certainly the, the unmanned platforms that are, are starting to see widespread use, are, it's going to continue. I mean, the Navy and its long-range planning does uh, plan to employ a fleet of, of unmanned aerial vehicles uh, from carrier decks and other surface ships. And I think certainly the helicopter and rotary wing aviation, really the progress of it and the, just the capabilities of it from humanitarian missions to, to combat missions is going to cause that particular platform to just to grow in number. But I think you'll still have a need for, for sea-based aviation and there will, there will be some pilots in the cockpits for years to come. Uh, quickly, Admiral Hoeing, how do you see it? Unmanned, helo, fixed wing, the answer is yes. You know, I see there's a bright future in naval aviation. There will be man in the system, uh, man, you know, person in the system from this day forward. And, uh, and I just see nothing but, uh, but opportunities out there for young people that are looking, looking for a, a, a career and naval aviation would be one of those great opportunities. Colonel Kiley, I'd like to thank you very much for appearing here with us today, and thank you for your service in Vietnam, Hill Goodspeed, the historian at the museum, and of course, uh, Admiral Hoeing getting ready to go with the new Flight Academy. Congratulations on getting thank that you. up and going. It's going to be exciting to see what happens as we pull out of here today. We'll leave you with the sights from a recent uh, show, one of our, our most famous uh, flight team here based out of Pensacola. Thank you for watching. Thank you.